Well, this evening we have really a kind of mystery story that involves itself in many elements and factors that do not lie strictly within the sphere of music. But in order to give the story somewhat basic orientation, I think we'll begin on the campus of the University of Ingolstadt, Bavaria, about the year 1770. Many things can start on college campuses, and uh, in a time of great political and social unrest, perhaps young people starting out in life have the clearest and most immediate recognition of the kind of a world into which they are going to be forced by circumstances to live and make their ways. In any event, on this campus, there were a great many groups of young men who took world conditions seriously, who resented the limitations imposed upon their abilities by a traditional and reactionary curriculum and like many of the young people of today were convinced that there were better ways of thinking and better ways of doing things than were being taught to them. Already the atmosphere was tense with reformation and revolution and the general discontent of masses extended even into the comparatively placid atmosphere of Bavaria. At this time, a young man was making quite a mark for himself in the faculty of law of the university. When only 27 years of age, he was made dean of the faculty of law itself a peculiar and remarkable uh, indication of his own internal abilities. This man's name was Adam Weishaupt, and on May 1st, 1776, just two or three months before the signing of the Declaration of Independence in the United States, Adam Weishaupt founded the Order of the Illuminati on the campus of the University of Ingolstadt. Now, the original form of this society has been said to involve two distinct elements, a noble concept of purpose and a total absence of plan. This would be appropriate under the condition a movement led by a very young man fired by still younger men, his own students, whose predicament touched him very deeply. The order of the Illuminati began with five persons. It began in the rooms of the Dean of Law. Fortunately, it did not remain there very long, for early in its development, Weishaupt came in contact with two very important men, Dr. Bold and Baron von Knega. These two powerful intellectuals, leaders in their own worlds, fired with the concept behind this movement through their personal weight and their personal influence, and with a result that was to be quite outstanding and unprecedented. The study of the Illuminist order in its brief history, for it only survived a very few years, tells us that while numerically its membership was never large, the quality of that membership was reminiscent of the Almanac de Gotha. Practically every important man in the progressive motion of European life, including a number of princes and rulers, were members of this fraternity. One of the earliest actions decided upon by Weishaupt was the tremendous necessity for the maintenance of complete secrecy. 
At that time, Ingolstadt was a nominal Jesuit college. And for many years to come, the struggle between the church and the liberals was to be heated and constant. And so the Illuminati devised an ingenious scheme. They took a map of Europe and they divided it according to a map of the ancient world, <coughs> restoring in different places uh, the names of then forgotten or at um, least long dead empires and kingdoms. They then divided their own members, assigning to each one a classical name, by which it would be almost impossible to identify them. And they wrote their own sort of private historical geography of world situations. For our present pur uh, purpose, it is important to note that in their new geography, the Illuminati assigned the name Egypt to Austria. And that from that time on, in all of their official documents, references to Egypt were references to Austria. The purposes behind the motion of the Illuminati were several. First and perhaps foremost, the advancement of the right of the human being to think. The intellectual progress should be rescued from a reactionary traditional form and allowed to develop and unfold according to humanist concepts and instincts. Another important uh, phase of their activity was the statement of their slogan or the motto of their society, namely, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And these exact words later became the cry of the French Revolution. There is much to indicate that the French Revolution was influenced by the Illuminists, or the Illuminati, who moved behind uh, the surface picture, and whose names were associated with a number of prominent individuals and intellectuals moving in the great uh, era of revolutions. Among the most distinguished of the Illuminists should be include, included Goethe, the Prince of saxe weimar the mysterious and elusive Saint Germain, the equally mysterious, though not quite so elusive, Cagliostro, and later Claude Saint Martin, and numerous other leaders in the great struggle for the rights of man. It is believed that this movement affected deeply Rousseau and Voltaire, and later in the United States, both Jefferson and Thomas Paine were accused of being members of this organization. So in a quiet but persuasive manner, the Illuminati spread beneath the surface of European thought. And its principal rituals, ceremonies, and rites were based upon the mysteries of the Greeks and Egyptians. For Weishaupt himself was a classicist, and among his desires was to restore the great philosophical systems of initiation education which dominated the ancient world. <laughs> he was unable to attain this end, but he still struggled valiantly toward it, and in their brief uh, span, the Illuminati became a most disconcerting force in European politics largely because they were so difficult to identify and uh, their presence was universally suspected whether they were there or not. The power of this organization became almost similar to that of the Ku Klux Klan in the South after the Civil War. It was feared by many, honored by some, and regarded as little short of miraculous by others. It gradually attracted to itself an elaborate symbolism derived partly from alchemy, partly from mythology, partly from capitalism, and all the mysterious secret societies of the 16th and 17th centuries. In the midst of all this excitement, Adam Weishaupt became a Freemason, and this was to have a bearing upon the later development.
for the lodge that he joined was almost immediately absorbed into the Illuminist movement, and it was not until considerably later uh, when the great Masonic councils were held to clarify the degrees and rights of the order uh, that the Illuminists were forced to clarify their Masonic position. It was all quite an involved and difficult situation, but this is one of our roots, because we learn by careful investigation that the outstanding Illuminist in Austria was Baron Ignis von Born, who was a metallurgist and highly honored in the court of Maria Theresa. This important man was a personal friend of Mozart, and it is believed that in the designing of the opera, The Magic Flute, von Born supplied much of the material, at least symbolically speaking, for the creation of the character of Sarastro, the great uh, priest of the mysteries of Isis and Osiris. Uh, Mozart himself was recommended for Freemasonry by uh, Baron von Gemmingen, a distinguished uh, member of the order, and the lodge to which he belonged, by some circumstance, was also very closely associated with von Born. And when uh, this great chemist perfected his method for metallic amalgamation and uh, certain uh, formulas for the hardening and purifying of metals, uh, Mozart wrote a piece of music to be played in the lodge, which at that time held a festival in honor of von Born. So we find that uh, Mozart, uh, Goethe, the Prince of Saxe-Weimar, Knega, Bold, and later the man who was entrusted with the development of the story of the magic flute, Shekinader, were all members of the Masonic Order. Uh, this has certain bearing upon our problem, but uh, we will pause in this direction for a moment and go back into another interesting byway that leads in the same general direction. About 1731, there was issued a book called The Life of Sethos. Incidentally, we have a copy of the rare first English edition of this work in our library for anyone who wishes to consult it. It was uh, published first in about 1731 and came into English about 1760 or 70 or thereabout. <coughs> the Life of Sethos was another book looking for an author, which sometimes happens in the world of literature. Uh, many suspects were advanced but no one was ever finally decided as uh, the guilty for the perpetration of this volume. The story claimed to have been found as a manuscript in a European library and to be a true account of a man by the name of Sethos, who lived in the classical period and who was initiated into the rites of Isis and Osiris. The third book of Sethos, deals, therefore, largely with the ritual of initiation, centering upon the passing of Orpheus and Eridice through the rites and rituals of the underworld. Various authors have commented upon the book of Sethos. It has generally been accepted as a fabrication. Who fabricated it and why, no one knows. But whoever did had a considerable familiarity with the writings of the classical authors, and his production belongs with two others, one called The Initiation of Plato, and the other, uh, the Krata Rapoa, or the uh, Rituals of Initiation into the Greek and Egyptian Mysteries, all of which came out at about the same time and contributed to the establishment of the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry by Alessandro Cagliostro. All of these different facets also indicated that in the 18th century there was a powerful rise of interest in Egyptian philosophy. This rise was prior to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, and nearly all of the records available were those from Roman sources, as, for instance, the hieroglyphics of Harapolonilus. In any event, however, there was a fanciful restoration of Egyptology. 
And this continued to remain more or less imaginative until, through the um, cooperation of Napoleon, the Rosetta Stone was made available to the students of uh, Egyptology and Euro in Europe, and Champollion supplied the necessary key to its interpretation. So we have the Book of Sethos, probably itself originating in one of the secret societies of Europe. Written for a distinct and definite purpose, this purpose very close to its ultimate adaptation by Mozart. These elements, then, seem to tell us something of the background of what has sometimes been referred to as Mozart's comic opera. Uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration, for there is nothing really less comic than the concept or the purpose behind it. I think we also have to bear in mind just a little something about Mozart himself. We know him as a musician. We know him as a man struggling for years against poverty. We know him as a genius and an artist and then practically an infant prodigy. But perhaps what we do not know about him was his fiery patriotism. He was a man moved from within himself by exactly the type of motivation that inspired Weishaupt in the founding of the Illuminist movement. It has never been possible to prove by documentation that Mozart belonged to this order, but certainly his sympathies were strongly with it. He was a patriot. He was fighting desperately, as maybe later we find in the case in Hungary of Katofi Sandor also a point, also a mystic, fighting desperately for the freedom of the Magyars. This great struggle for, for mental or elect, intellectual emancipation in Europe uh, uh, influenced Mozart's career to a large degree to its economic detriment. His very dislike for patronage, as it had been previously doled out, his resistance to merely becoming a pawn a musical pawn in the court of Austria, it contributed to his impoverishment, probably his discouragement, and early death. But we know Mozart was a person of great humanitarian convictions. And perhaps in the story of the magic flute, he has summarized or brought together the choicest of his reflections, and with the assistance of those who cooperated to make the project possible, he was able to fit together a very convincing and very wonderful allegory. It is also noted in the uh, libretto of the magic flute that while mysteries, symbols, and even occasional Masonic emblems appear and are used, there is not one single line of the opera that can be considered in any way an expose of masonry. Evidently, Mozart being himself under the obligations of the craft, was exceedingly careful and conscientious in producing a fantasy that was essentially Masonic and yet without any direct uh, bearing which might be regarded as an expose of Masonry. Now the interpreters of the story have a variety of possible selections upon which to base the purpose of the opera itself. Perhaps it would be well, therefore, to point out that at that time, Masonic lodges in Austria were having a rather bad period. Maria Theresa was violently opposed to the order, but her son Joseph II was himself a Mason, and this brought the controversy directly into the royal household. Uh, Maria Theresa is known on one occasion to have visited a Masonic lodge and attempted to break it up by introducing troops, soldiers, detectives, and other personnel from the state. At that particular time, her own son was in lodge with the brethren and had to depart hastily through a back window. All of this might indicate that situations were a bit tense at that time. In fact, after the comparatively liberal reign of Joseph, the Austrian masonry may, said to have, may be said to have almost completely vanished, and for nearly a century there were no Masonic activities 
under the black eagle of the Habsburgs. So the uh, situation of masonry was precarious, and masonry at that time was being tied very closely to the revolutionary spirit rising in Europe, and uh, associated uh, very closely with the determination to improve educational uh, opportunities for the people and to advance uh, democracy and uh, what Paine and Rousseau so aptly refer to as the rights of man. This situation um, is more or less involved in Mozart's personal life and considerably involved in the story of the magic flute. We know that this also was not Mozart's only Masonic contributions. He prepared uh, short pieces of music based even upon the themes of Masonic ritual. These were played by the lodge, and the lodge to which he belonged paid his widow a small amount of money for the rights to his Masonic music after his death. This small amount of money, uh, relatively nothing, constituted the major part of his estate. For uh, even to this day, the grave of Mozart is unknown because he was buried in Potter's Field. The mourners were so few that even the spot remained unidentified and his wife was traveling in a distant region at the time. So uh, Mozart uh, as far as his own physical life is concerned, lived a very difficult and sorrow-laden existence. But there was a tremendous spirit within the man which was revealed not only through his music, but through his humanitarian instincts and ideals. So now perhaps we have laid some foundation for a more careful examination of the story itself. The story of the magic flute is a comparatively simple one, but it has a number of interesting minor involvements. In the first place, it deals with a romantic fairy tale situation, derived in part from the mythology of the ancients, especially the abduction of Prosephone by Hades, which of course ties it directly to the Eleusinian mysteries of the Greeks. In this story, as it is presented in the opera, a handsome young man, the eternal hero of the world, uh, Prince Tamino, wanders mysteriously and strangely into the domains of the Queen of the Night. Now, the Queen of the Night rules over a fanciful world. And in this world, which is much of the world of Grimm and Anderson, uh, many strange and miraculous things can happen. And while Prince Camino is wandering in this region, he is attacked by a great serpent. Uh, this great serpent pursues him, and as the young prince is unarmed, he finds grave difficulty in escaping, and gives up all hope that his life will be spared, when three mysterious maidens, called genii, appear, armed with spears with silver points, these slay the serpent, even while the prince himself lies unconscious from exhaustion on the ground. When he awakens from his exhaustion and from the abject fear into which the experience has precipitated him, the young prince looks up to find himself confronted by a most extraordinary creature. This creature gives the rough impression of being human. But actually, the parts of his body are covered with bird feathers. And he jumps around and makes strange sounds and noises and seems quite the clown and quite the eccentric. He is Papagano, a mysterious being who uh, is more or less of a fool and a buffoon. Papagano is uh, always boastful, however and under a little pressure, admits that he is the one who slew the snake and saved uh, the young prince. About this time, the three genii, or maidens with their silver-tipped spears, appear, tell the truth, and punish Papageno by placing upon his lips a padlock so that he may not speak from that time on, so that for some time he, some time, he wanders about grunting and puffing against the padlock, but unable to make any particularly articulate sounds. 
The three maidens, or the three genii, then tell the young prince, Tamino, uh, that they belong to the suite of the queen of the night, that she knows that he has wandered into her region, and that she desires to speak to him and know him because she has a very definite and particular errand which she would like to have him perform. In due course, the young prince discovers what this errand is. It seems that the daughter of the Queen of the Night has been strangely and mysteriously abducted by a mysterious person named Sarastro, who was Grand Master of the Mysteries of Isis and Osiris. Now, of course, the Queen of the Night wishes her daughter, Famina, to be restored to her. And so she supplies the young prince with certain things necessary to accomplish the rescuing of this fair maiden. Among other things, because he does not know the region, nor is he capable of coping with the enchantments of Sarastro, she gives him a magic flute uh, with seven openings on which strange and wonderful melodies can be played. And she also gives him a jewel-encrusted framed portrait of her daughter, so that he may recognize the princess when he sees her. As a somewhat less useful uh, aide, or what you may term associate, the young prince also inherits Papageno, who uh, promises to complicate almost any situation. Uh, Papageno, of course, also needs something to help him to take care of the difficulties of his assignment, so he is given an instrument called a branch of bells, which in actuality is a form of the old Egyptian system, or rattle that was used in connection with the ceremonies of the Temple of Isis. Uh, the group then start out on their journey, and with due and proper adventures, attempt the rescue of the fair princess, who is being held in bondage, presumably, by Sarastro. They come finally to his palace, which is presented in the opera as an Egyptian-like building or temple. And here, priests and other dignitaries bearing Masonic symbols and chanting ancient rituals uh, form an appropriate background. Now, we were also introduced at this time to another interesting and rather curious character who is a sort of jail keeper or general overseer in the court of Sarastro, and this is Monostatus the Moor, a strange, dark man who would like to be a villain, but is not very successful at it. Uh, as a villain, he is in love with the fair princess, but she not only spurns his advances, but Sarastro, ever watchful, makes certain that all his conspiracies come to nothing, so that uh, the Moor plays the part of a very frustrated individual who is unable to succeed in almost any of his undertakings. Uh, of course, the meeting of Pamina and Tamino uh, results in the rise of romance, and uh, Sarastro guards this situation also with great thoughtfulness. In the due time, the Queen of the Night, who is not at all pleased with the direction that events are taking, uh, also enters into the a palace of Sarastro, forcibly, perhaps reminiscent of uh, Maria Teresa trying to break up the Masonic meeting in Vienna, and gives her daughter a dagger, suggesting that it would be wise for her to slay Sarastro. At this time, however, the young prince becomes under an obligation of secrecy in connection with the rituals of the mysteries of Isis and Osiris. While under secrecy, he is misunderstood by Pamina, who, thinking that he no longer cares for her, attempts to kill herself. The plot becomes more and more complicated at this time, but in their attempt to leave the palace, or to leave the uh, sh shrine of initiation, the two young people come under the direct influence of Sarastro, who prepares them, and for them, the elaborate ceremonial of initiation into the rites of Isis and Osiris. While wandering about also in the mysterious underworld, Papageno has quite a little experience of his own. 
He has only one great desire in life, and that is to find himself a feathered mate of mentality and nature similar to his own. Because he is quite an eccentric, it looks very doubtful if he'll ever succeed. But in this underground and subterranean region of mysteries, he is confronted with an ancient witch, or hag, who is about as little what he demands as anything could possibly be. She is a horrible creature, but uh, with uh, considerable force of character, she points out that unless he will consent to marry her, he will never leave the underworld alive. This is a, a very doubtful situation, and leaves poor Papageno, who is no hero at any time, uh, with very little choice. In due course, however, it proves that this uh, strange, witch-like person is really a good spirit in disguise, because suddenly the old hag is transformed into the feathered mate that Papageno has been seeking all the time, and they, of course, have a joyous union, and all goes well with them. In the meantime, uh, the rituals of Isis and Osiris are arranged, and the two young lovers pass through the strange ceremonies of the underworld. The stage for this is very beautifully set, uh, and uh, when the curtain rises, the tests of the elements are revealed. The stage is so divided that it has three doorways, one in the center and one on each side. The side doors are grated, uh, covered with bars, and behind the one on one side is seen flames rising and smoke and combustion. Whereas on the other side, behind the door, is seen streams of water, like a great waterfall flowing from an unknown source. Uh, between these doors and the central entrance are high columns surmounted by figures in armor. It is a very impressive uh, scene. Uh, Pamino and Tamina, uh, the uh, young uh, lovers, are able to pass through the initiations because he plays constantly upon the flute, and because of the music of the flute, no ill can come to him. Having therefore passed successfully through the flames and through the tests of water, the young lovers pass through the central door, the scene changes, and they are in the great chapel temple of the mysteries. Here, presided over by Sarastro in his flowing robes, bearing a scepter, surmounted by an effulgent and radiant sun globe, and surrounded by his priests, musicians, and retinue. Uh, the great master of our elephant blesses the young couple, unites them in spiritual union, and assures them that they have passed successfully through this great test which was prepared for them. Everything ends in a note of heroic victory and in a musical uh, situation which suggests great elevation and spiritual co accomplishment and consciousness. This is, in very brief, the story of the opera. And it is upon this foundation that the various critics have attempted to explain it, interpret it, and discover its inner meaning. At least five different systems have been applied to the interpretation of the magic flute. These cover almost every phase of contemporary life and philosophical abstraction. First of all, it has been uh, assumed, for example, that the Queen of the Night represented definitely Maria Theresa. Uh, this uh, concept uh, is extended also into other phases. The young prince, uh, Tamino, is believed to be Joseph II, who was in favor of and a protector of masonry in Austria. By this same concept, Tamina, uh, Tamina is the Austrian people whose uh, salvation and redemption the young prince is determined uh, to advance. Sarastro is a combination of masonry, science, knowledge, education, and reason, representing practically all of the forces of the new humanism and the spirit of progress and liberation 
which is to initiate the people of Austria into psychological and even literal democratic living and thinking. In this same uh, concept, the black moor, monostatus, becomes the symbol of the Jesuits, which at that time were regarded as particularly difficult because a certain man under their influence by the name of Hoffman was responsible for scandals against masonry which caused the closing of the Austrian lodges. Therefore he is believed to have been uh, personified in this uh, drama or in this concept. Thus the drama would be very largely an unfoldment of the political life of the time. But it is quite improbable that such exhausted Mozart's original intention, because he certainly used a favorable situation, uh, because in many respects, the more the interpretations, the more numerous the viewpoints, uh, the more certain the real meaning could be concealed, because it was always possible to blame it to this or blame it to that, and keep it away from those who might otherwise uh, be moved to act against it in a powerful and organized manner. As a fantasy, it could be produced and presented, where if the same remarks had been made in a severe literary style, the author would probably have been subjected to extreme punishment, imprisonment, or exile. Now, when we go into the, this question a little further, then, we realize that the entire drama, derived in part at least from the life of Sethos, does go back to a certain degree into the rituals of the old mysteries, where uh, much more than contemporary politics would be considered. We recognize under the veil, therefore, of the Queen of the Night, uh, the ancient goddess Cori, or Ceres, who was the uh, strange and peculiar patroness of the harvest and of the rituals of food and plenty and uh, the home and to a great degree the entire normal or moral life of mankind. It was the daughter of Cori, Prosephone, who was abducted by Hades or Pluto and taken into the underworld. The abduction, therefore, could well parallel the abduction of Pamina, who was taken away by Sarastro, a strange person living in a darkened sphere or palace with subterranean abodes and mysterious places beneath it. This deity, of course, is also as closely associated with Osiris, who, after his uh, martyrdom, became lord of the underworld, and the rituals of the Osirian rites were nearly always practiced in subterranean caves or crypts or rooms under the temples. So here we have two phases of the god of the underworld abducting the fair daughter of the goddess of the night. Under the same situation, Monostatus, it pay, plays very close to the Egyptian concept of Typhon, uh, the betrayer, uh, the false one, who was also referred to as Dark, and who was believed to have been a form of the Prince of Evil. These characters, being variously distinguished, it becomes evident then that the young prince always represents the person, the initiate, the hero the one to whom these adventures must naturally occur, and through whose regeneration and whose enlightenment represents, of course, the liberation of man himself. So we can have a new group of elements involved in this, which can go even as far as Asia, if we wish to, in search of a deeper and more mystical and metaphysical meaning for our story. In this same classification, Papageno comes in also as a form of the old deity Pan, the god of nature. And, of course, the system symbolizing the agitations of nature, as Plutarch says, could associate with him as well as with Isis, whose part also seemingly mingles with that of the queen of the night. 
So we have quite a complicated situation uh, which calls perhaps for an interpretation on a level of Greek metaphysical philosophy. This is perfectly reasonable inasmuch as it was dominating the Illuminists of the time, particularly von Born, who was brought in in consultation on the development of the opera, and quite possibly was very close to the soul of Mozart himself. When on one occasion Goethe was told that the magic flute was little better than a fantasy, he replied quietly, it may seem so to the average spectator, but not to those of us who are initiated. And he seemed to be very clear in his statement of this point. So now we have an interesting concept to build upon. The Egyptians divided the universe into three essential parts. One was a universe of spirit, or of eternal light, the abode of the gods. One was a sphere of matter, which as in the case of the Platonic philosophy in Greece was called the underworld. And between these two was the abode of heroes, or of those who had liberated themselves from darkness, or who had been born again through the rites of the mysteries. In Egypt, as in many other ancient custom countries, we find that Isis, as the mother of mysteries, as the great Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, the Motamamia, the universal mother, that this deity always represents the mystery school itself. She is the widow whose sons become the liberators and the golden hawks of light who are to save the world. Therefore, the initiate was always referred to as the son of the widow, because Isis, wearing the weeds of a widow and with ashes upon her head, wandered about the earth, mourning the loss of her lord, the god Osiris. The mysteries, then, were nocturnal and subterranean, and consisted principally of an account of the wandering of the human soul in the underworld during the state of mortality or ignorance. Plutarch, in his Cave of the Nymphs, gives us another example of this drama, and part of the setting would almost agree with the great initiation scene in the Magic Flute. According to Plutarch, the Cave of the Nymphs, who might well be the three genii who appeared to uh, the young prince, has two openings one of which is the entrance and the other is the exit. From this entrance, steps lead downward into a crypt, and opposing upon the opposite side, steps ascend to an exit. And the gate of entrance is called Cancer, and the gate of exit is called Capricorn. And the dome of the cave is covered with stars, but the bottom of it is rough and rocky, and it is filled with strange shadows, and wonderful and uh, lamenting music is heard, and strange spirits move about, and those who enter into this underworld are attacked by shadows, by mysterious monsters, against whom they must contend for victory. The same situation was set up in the catacombs under Rome, in the celebration of the ancient Mithraic mysteries. And when the emperor Comedus was initiated into the Mithraic rites, he was attacked by phantoms and defended himself so vigorously that he killed one of the priests accidentally, who was uh, disguised as a phantom. The, uh, roman the dramatic ritual uh, seemingly affected the emperor a little too strenuously. As uh, the ritual of this situation proceeds, we see that through the gate of birth, man descends into a dark world, ruled over by mysteries, ruled over by mortality and death. And in this world, which is also the world of Pan, the world uh, which we referred to in our last discussion, in which Mephisto plays the part of the deity Pan. In the magic flute, Pan is a more or less helpless creature a mountebank, but does still represent the accidents and vicissitudes of nature and of the rustic or natural situation of primitive mankind. 
In the ritual of initiation, therefore, man born at the gate of cancer is immediately presented with the cup of Lethe, which is a small constellation near to cancer, which is called the constellation of the crator, or cup. In this constellation, and in the symbol thereof, man born into matter goes to sleep, or loses all memory, for the cup of Lethe is the cup of forgetfulness. He thereby forgets his heavenly origin, forgets the world from which he came, and finds himself strangely immersed in the mysterious regions ruled over by the Queen of the Night. And the Queen of the Night is the Moon, and later the Queen of the Night is Isis. But to man coming into the world at the beginning, this material world is not a place of initiation, or a place of regeneration. It is a place of terrors and fears, ruled over by the tyranny of darkness and ignorance. Therefore, the Queen of the Night may be both Maria Teresa as a symbol of the absolute sovereignty and tyranny of matter, or Isis as the ever-prudent and ever-guiding mother, the nurse, the Hathor, the cow-headed one of Egypt who lead souls finally into the realization that the experiences of mortality are for the regeneration of man and not merely for his destruction. In any event, the wandering through the underworld carries man into the presence of the serpent and the danger of death. The serpent appears in the Sigurd saga where uh, young Siegfried or Sigurd must slay it. And the slaying of the dragon or the serpent as found in the myth of St. George of Cappadocia, also in, comes into this picture. The serpent is the ancient symbol of illusion, and the struggle between man, his mind, his being, his life, and illusion <coughs> is a very important one. Even in the time of the rise of the French mysteries during the period of Cagliostro and St. Germain, it was pointed out uh, that man possesses within himself a mysterious agency, which is called the astral light. The astral light is the substance from which the magic garden of King Saul was composed in the opera of Parsifal. And the uh, 19th century French transcendentalist, Alephus Levy, refers to the astral light as a mysterious world of beauty and flowers, beautiful blossoms, radiant and inspiring, and around the stem of each flower twisted a poisonous serpent. It's a quite a dramatic, uh, symbolic picture. But the world of the astral light is simply the sphere of human imagination, uncontrolled and undirected by reason. It is man subject constantly to the delusions of his own emotions and thinking. So man, seeking to control, master, or even survive in the darkness of the underworld, must slay the serpent of imagination, or in this case, the, the serpent of fantasy. This is actually excellent Buddhism, because it is told to us in the teachings uh, of the Diamond Sutra, for example, that because of the phenomenal existence engendered by the sensory function of man, the human being lives in a world that has no existence except that which he bestows upon it. The human being, who could move serenely like the candidate for the mysteries, uh, through this dark region and come safely to the gate of Capricorn, which leads through the mystery of death to the mystery of immortality. Uh, this human being, instead of living a dignified and noble existence, in the underworld and its mysterious passageways, is actually tormented constantly by fantasy and hallucination. Fantasy in this case meaning all false or unreasonable ends or ideas which dominate him. The fantasy of ambition, the fantasy of pride, of selfishness, of greed, the fantasy of, of passion and appetite, the fantasy of success or failure, all of the innumerable forces which deprive man of his no natural nobility may be inferred. We perhaps know a little better about this fantasy element uh, than was generally known a hundred or two hundred years ago. 
because it is coming strongly to us in our studies of psychology. We know that the, that the delusions, frustrations, neuroses, complexes, and psychoses which affect man are nothing but delusions arising within himself. His own false estimations of value, his own misunderstandings, his own natural instincts to be selfish, uh, to create doubt and uncertainty, and his criticism, his jealousy, all of these things turning upon him like monsters, destroy his peace of mind, and prevent him thereby from fulfilling the natural destiny for which he is intended. The three genii, like the three fates, or the three norms, represent the dimensions of time. They also represent the intuitive powers by means of which man is able to be protected from these evils. Uh, in one system of interpretation, they are likened to the three graces, faith, hope, and charity through the practice of which the, dra the dragon or demon is discomfited and the serpent is killed with the silver-tipped spears. Also in this lower world, man discovers another kind of creature, Papageno. This creature has never lived anywhere else and represents the natural and rustic nature of primitive man. Here the truth seeker discovers, for example, that the world around him was filled with people who do not particularly wish to know anything. Not interested in seeking truth, but interested only in finding a mate like themselves and settling down and living out their lives. They have no ambitions of any importance, no aspirations. They do not know how to tell the truth, and in order to control them at all, a padlock must be placed upon their lips. They represent a primitive type of materiality, which also is to be found lurking in this subterranean world. And this materiality uh, divides itself in the nature of man. Or as Goethe says in his Faust, uh, there are two souls within man. One to the heaven aspires, and the other in the earth suspires. And many people, many interpreters, have held that Papageno represents the lower octave of the hero himself, representing compromise, comfort, and all these things which would lure the individual away from great and noble purpose. Another interpretation, of course, is that Papageno simply represents the physical body, which never knows what anything is about, babbles constantly, and is constantly pressing forward for the fulfillment of its physical creature comforts and its biological urges. Uh, this body uh, cannot and must not be acknowledged as a leader, and yet in some mysterious way it must be present, because without the fool the hero cannot undertake his journey, and the body thereby becomes this nominal hindrance, uh, this capering feathered thing, uh, which uh, contributes very little, but does make an occasional, uh, fairly valid contribution to the general situation. If we consider, therefore, that uh, Papageno represents simply matter, either in the physical life of man, in the materialism of the human mind, or in the rustic materialism of human society, we probably will not be too far from the facts of the matter. The body seeking only peace, comfort, and security is not heroic, but may be forced to an occasional exhibition of heroism by the hero self that lives within it. Thus, the young prince, wandering around in search of his mission, is presented with the next important concept, uh, which we find in metaphysics. Isis, Cori, Ceres, the great Diana of the Ephesians, and many other of these deities, actually embody or personify or represent in the mystery systems the world soul, or the great psychic nature, uh, which lies in the root substance or archetypal measure of things. According to the Greek mythology, the great gods, the spiritual beings, uh, the unmoved movers of all things, 
cause to emanate from themselves that which is called the self-moving. And the self-moving is the psychic field or the median distance in man's nature, which we call today the soul. The soul in nature, according to Pythagoras, is its animating part. Therefore, it is the anima, or the psychic energy sphere, from which all of man's sensory and even his intuitive faculties are supported and sustained. Modern psychology would define the soul principally as mind and emotion. The ancients, however, would have had a slightly different concept. They did not consider the mind as part of the soul, essentially. They considered the intellectual principle as a separate spiritual element in nature. But they did count that part of man which is essentially uh, religious, the emotion of devotion, of love, of piety. These things pertain to the soul, which Pythagoras represented by an eight-faced symmetrical solid, because he said that the soul had eight attributes, of which the lowest, or eighth, was the attribute of generation. If, therefore, the world soul, the psychic field, which is the soul of deity, would be regarded as Isis, or as the queen of the night, then the human soul would be her daughter, apart from this universal soul. Socrates, the contemplative life, the attainment of the various cathartic disciplines, the relaxation of man's pressures, uh, the overcoming of selfishness and personal intensities, and the cultivation of the noble and serene life of wisdom. These things cause a separation between the soul and the body, by which the soul is permitted to be clarified, to become the ruler of the body or the master of it, and is given dominion over the corporeal nature and its limitations. Thus it is said that by death uh, the body is violently separated from the soul, but by initiation into the mysteries the soul is gently separated from the body. And the uh, difference becomes essentially part of the old rituals. If then we consider the hero to be the spirit purpose, the will of man, resolved to rescue his own soul, from its subterranean abode, we can see why, entering into the regions of Sarastro, that the drama should be concluded by what appears to be an irrelevant ceremony. In the original form of the story, there seems no reason why the rescuing of uh, Pamina should result in a ritual of initiation. It is not uh, particularly indicated as necessary. The point, of course, is that there is no way out of the underworld without the mystery of initiation. There are only two ways out of matter, violent through death, gentle through wisdom. That which is violent, however, is a separation of the body from the soul, but is not in any sense a relieving of the soul of the burden of worldliness. Death takes man out of the world, but initiation takes worldliness out of the man, and these two are vastly different things. Buddha points this out in his doctrine of rebirth, stating that the loss of body has no essential effect upon consciousness, for consciousness must be rescued by a direct act of volition and not by an accident of death. In other words, death is the common accident of man, but immortality is attained only by a purposeful intent and is never attained accidentally. And again we can remember the lines from Faust, how closely linked are luck and merit. Doth never to the fool occur at either wise man's stone. I swear it, the stone had no philosopher. And that is the concept again in the magic flute. 
So in spite of the fact that probably neither the hero nor the heroine had given any particular consideration to the matter, Sarastro, as master of the mysteries, realizes that the only escape from the, of these two into the philosophic empire is by the mystery of initiation. And it is also only in that way that they can overcome the temporal power of the Queen of the Night. And the Queen of the Night, to the very end, seeks to frustrate this end, because representing mortality, she also presents her demands, and her demands are that man shall leave this world only by death, indicated by the presentation of the dagger. The Queen of the Night also wishes to dispose of the High Priest, Sarastro, who stands between her and her physical control of the universe. For there is only one thing that stands between mortality, as we know it, and the mortal state, and the attainment of self-illumination or discipline, and that is the ritual of initiation, represented and impersonated in the Hierophant of the Mysteries. For the master of the secret of the transformation from one world to another is the adept king, the hierophant or the initiate priest. He is the possessor of wisdom, and wisdom forms the living bridge or ladder by which man ascends out of the world of darkness. And the song of wisdom, the glory of it, the importance of it, and to a degree its social significance will be found in the lines given to Sarastro in the opera. So Sarastro as the initiator becomes again Gurnemans, the old knight, the Merlin of King Arthur, everywhere the principle of wisdom which is to lead these two young people through the mysteries of darkness and ignorance to the final attainment of a spiritual security. Uh, the power of Monostatus, the um, black moor or the adversary, is said in this analogy to represent the lower emotional body of man. So we now have a series of factors in which appetite, greed, and ambition, the physical propensities of man, seek to also control the soul to adapt the energy of the soul to their own purpose. In other words, the dark moor seeks uh, to uh, possess the soul for itself. This is uh, also carried in another way in the story of Samson, who is, of course, a symbol of the sun man, the young hero prince, as in the uh, operatic story. This Samson is blinded and bound to the millstone of the Philistines which represents psychic energy or spiritual strength or force bound to materialism and caused to perform the physical activities of a materialistic way of life. Therefore, whenever we speak of ambition, whenever we speak of schemes, stratagems, conspiracies and spoils, whenever we think of men who, like Cassius, have a lean and hungry look, we are recognizing the perversion of soul power in which the psychic strength of human nature has been caused to enter a state of bondage uh, with the lower emotional nature so that the psychic powers of man are used to injure man, hurt man, or destroy man through selfishness. The soul thus bound to the lower world uh, is said, uh, would be said to be captured by the black moor. However, Sarastro, wisdom, will not let this take place. And whenever the Moor thinks he has accomplished his end, Sarastro, or true wisdom, works a conspiracy which frustrates it. Thus man, in his search for reality in the ritual drama, uh, has the devil's advocate, but he also has the faithful guide and leader his Virgil, who is to conduct him and assist him through the mysteries of the underworld. The magic flute, of course, uh, abridges somewhat uh, the two into two the great initiation rites of the elements. Uh, these initiation rites are found not as much in the very early sources, 
as they are in the later restorational material. Uh, during the period from about the rise of Kabbalism in Spain, under the Moors, by the way, uh, through the Rosicrucian hermetic uh, 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 cycle, into the Illuminists, and finally into the works and rituals of St. Germain and Cagliostro, we find the initiation of the four elements taking quite a place. And very shortly after the publication of the life of Sethos, uh, there was an important Masonic text issued, uh, which also described these initiation rites, and they are found in the Krata Rapoa, an another fanciful restoration of the Egyptian mysteries. These represented the passage of the neophyte through the four elements to represent victory over earth, which is the physical life, water, which is the vital or psychic life, fire, which is the emotional nature, and air, which is the mental principle. These four initiations, therefore, are man learning to control the four vehicles or bodies which he has at his disposal, the physical, vital, emotional, and mental bodies. His victory over these bodies is achieved by his victory over the principles which they represent. The victory over materialism is therefore the initiation of earth, represented primarily usually by the subterranean location and sometimes by the burial in a stone sarcophagus, which is appropriate to the principal symbolism of earth. Transition through water or the crossing of a flooded stream or as in the case of the Druid uh, initiate, Teliasan, who is sent out to sea in an open boat without oars, which he must control by his will. The initiation by water represents the purification of the vital principle, as representing particularly the purification of the generative power of man. The initiation of fire, represented in this rite by a long passageway filled with smoke and flames and combustion, but variously depicted in other rituals, indicates man's control of the intensities of his emotional and desire natures. Here he must fight with the fire within himself, the fire of hate, the fire of anger, uh, the fire of lust, uh, the fire of temper. All of these things must be subdued, because unless man controls these emotions, he cannot have ultimate victory. Lastly, the initiation of air either takes place upon some highly mountainous region or involves a motion through the air, a teleportation, or being carried like the Chinese immortal from this world to the other on a cloud. There is always the initiation of air. In the Sigurd saga, it was the dead hero being carried to Valhalla on the horse of the Valkyrie fly, uh, flying through the air. The airy element was the principle of mind, or thought, and the subduing or overcoming of the mental nature and the mental instincts uh, constituted victory over the element of air, because it was this air which by its vacillation, its inconstancy, and its inability to attain a state of discipline or settledness, its abstraction, its invisibility, like thought itself, caused man to have great difficulties in controlling it, directing it, mastering it, and finally dedicating it to the purposes of the mysteries. In the magic flute, only two of the four initiations are clearly set forth, although the others are represented by the subterranean world, and finally the luminous pageant at which they are with which the drama terminates. The two initiations of fire and water are reminiscent of the baptisms referred to in the New Testament. For John the baptizer baptized with water, but the one who came after him, who was pre preferred before him, baptized with the Holy Spirit which is fire. So baptism by fire and water uh, is also very carefully uh, perpetuated in the ritual as it was originally shown at the time of the initiation of Abraham by Melchizedek, Prince of Salem. For in this case, we have the, in, the baptism by corn, wine, and oil, or bread, or grain, wine, and oil. In the Last Supper of Jesus, we have the wine and the bread. And someone has said, what has happened to the oil? 
which was necessary to the ancient ritual of Melchizedek, and the anointing of the head with oil. And of course the answer lies that the word Christ from Christos, Christo, means oil. Therefore Christ himself was the oil, and he also completed the sacrament with the bread and wine and restored or restated the sacrament of Melchizedek. So the initiation in the two elements as represented in the opera represent purification by fire and water. Purification by fire, the higher of the two rites, uh, represented the purification of the soul or psychic nature, and by water the purification of the body or the material nature. Water was the symbol of cleanliness the cleanness of both the body, the soul, and all of its attributes. By fire we have the initiation of inspiration, or the individual cleansing and purifying the higher or spiritual parts of his own nature. So body was purified by water, soul was purified by fire. That is why in the legends of both the, the Sigurd Saga and the Arthurian epic, we have the sword representing will or spirit, uh, which is tempered upon the anvil and uh, is made to be true steel by passing through the mystery of fire. Fire, therefore, tempers the sword of will and gives it the strength or the keenness for the labors for which it is intended. Having successfully passed through the ordeals, of fire and water, the young couple now representing the amalgam of spirit and soul, or of the higher and lower psychic natures, or the androgene anima animus within man, are then led together into the presence of the great court of the priest of Osiris. In this situation also we have had an experience of changing worlds. For in passing into the great throne room, or the wonderful place of the mysteries, the candidate has ascended the sacred spiral staircase, the staircase of evolution with its three, five, and seven steps, and has come finally to the gate of the celestial splendors. He has therefore passed through the gate of Capricorn, uh, which was to the ancients the gate of death. But his death has been symbolical rather than literal. Because in the initiation ritual of all peoples, the higher degrees always parallel and correspond to the mortuary rites. It is that the individual is dying to an old life or to an old way of life. His rebirth is the symbol of the resurrection of consciousness from body. It is the restoration of the glory of the soul. It is the soul that has now achieved conscious freedom from the enmeshments of the body. And in the alchemical mysteries, this is represented by Christ ro rolling away the stone of the tomb and rising, bearing in his hands the symbol of the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone. Thus the restoration, or the rolling away of the stone, is the spiritual life of man and is the mystery of the second birth. This again parallels the Greek ritual because when uh, the initiate, having completed the higher degrees of the Eleusinian rite, came forth between the columns of the temple to receive the plaudits of the people, he was hailed as one who was dead and who has been reborn. Part of this ritual, incidentally, remains in the story of the prodigal son, which is another story of exactly the same principle. And when the prodigal son returns to his father's house, and the offerings and the feasts are prepared for him, the father says, For my son who was dead is alive again. And yet the story does not imply physical death. It is a distinct statement of the mysteries. For that which descends into the flesh pots of Egypt and wastes its substance in riotous living is said to die. Therefore Plato points out that birth into materialism is death, and death from materialism into enlightenment is birth, and all of the other is of seeming, 
whereas this is of being or of true reality. It was consequently customary in the Greek period and in the Egyptian period to refer to an initiate as one twice born or thrice born. For man is first born from the womb of his mother and is the second time born from the womb of the mysteries or the alma mater, the mother of wisdom. And uh, this thought, of course, is c conveyed in the Hermetic tradition, where Hermes is referred to as the thrice-born one, or the thrice-greatest, and in honor of that was given the title Thrismegistus, meaning the thrice-greatest, or the thrice-born one. So the young couple, representing the reborn spiritual life of man that has passed successfully through the testing of the initiations and rites. Is then, are then brought, the couple is then brought into the presence of Sarastro, who representing reason, illumination, knowledge, is also the personification of the secret doctrine itself. He bears in his hand a tall scepter like staff, surmounted by a golden orb, and from this golden orb, rays of light in the form of golden lines spread out and form a kind of nimbus. He is therefore a symbol of the spiritual sun, the same one that is described by Apuleius in his Metamorphosis, where he says he saw the sun, the sun shining at midnight in the ritual of the mysteries. The uh, Sarastro therefore now becomes uh, the symbol of the sun in the midst of the glorious universe of truth. His temple, his world, represents the new age, the coming world, the world of light, and also the, res the restored kingdom of truth upon the earth. And it is to the Illuminists and some of this group that we are indebted for this very interesting and powerful concept. Namely, that the so-called kingdom of heaven is actually symbolical of the kingdom of brotherly love, or human fraternity, which is established here on earth, and the establishment of which is the goal of the great system of the mysteries, and has been this goal since the dawn of time. In other words, the great throne room in which the final rituals are given represents perfected human society, ruled over by the philosopher king, dominated by the, re the reign of reason, <coughs> perfect in all things, and, in passing, uh, Weishaupt's great concept of the restoration of education through the restoration of the mysteries and the great systems of spiritual apprenticeship. Now, the name of the story, of course, the name of the opera, is derived from the magic flute. Therefore, perhaps we should pause for just a moment and see what all this flute is about. Because, like the musical instrument of Orpheus, it seems to have an interesting history. The Orphic lyre had seven strings. The magic flute had seven notes. And this flute is, of course, the same one that is carried by Krishna in India, and upon which he plays the mysterious melodies which charm the gopis and cause the shepherd maidens to dance in their circle of twelve around him, as symbolical of the zodiac moving in its sacred dance around the sun. This also is the mysterious instrument of Shiva, for either as a flute or as a vena with seven stops or frets upon it, this instrument, according to the Hindus, represented the monochord, or the great chain of vibratory harmonics that unites heaven and earth. Pythagoras describes it as the monochord of the world, with its lower end placed in the element of earth and its upper end at the sphere of the fixed stars and the orbits of the planets and elements as frets dividing the chord, so that from these divisions came the great harmonic and enharmonic intervals of music. Uh, this music of the spheres, uh, this mysterious musical instrument, has a number of interesting meanings. One of the most simple of these meanings, of course, is the human spinal cord, uh, with its seven mysterious tones, or chakras, or gates, through which energy ascends and descends as in the legend of Jacob's Ladder. 
In the ritual of this story, therefore, the base of the spine and the lower part of man's body would represent the underworld in which the lower initiations are given, whereas the dome temple of the skull, uh, in the midst of which is the ventricular opening of the brain with its priestly symbols posited there, as in the story of Parsifal, would represent the ascent of the spinal spirit fire in man by means of the double system. Uh, this double system is a very interesting and curious thing, for through the spinal cord itself, through the sixth ventricle, move, moves the Shashumna Nadi, uh, which begins at the base of the spine as the serpent of evil that must be slain, and later ascends through this spinal cord uh, to be referred to apparently. Now this is a possible extension of meaning, but it seems to be indicated. Namely, that this is the mysterious Christos, or fire power, which, if it be lifted up, shall draw all men unto it. This, apparently, is the reference of St. Paul. Now, the rising of the Shashumna Nadi uh, is accompanied by another phenomenon. And this phenomenon is the restoration or stimulation of the autonomic nervous system represented by two other channels or two other forces referred to in Indian philosophy as the Ida and Pingala or the black and white serpents that twist through and form parts of the psychic nervous system of the human being. These two or this autonomic system which is raised with the spinal system with the cerebral system may also be likened to the soul ganglia. And in this way, the rise of the Shashumna Nadi rescues the soul, which it draws with it upward into the great mystery temple of initiation, where Sarastro, representing the Brahma power in the brain, receives these two and unites them in an eternal hermetic marriage. Thus the human body and its more esoteric symbolism becomes also involved in the story of the magic flute. And at this stage of it, I cannot but pause to, uh, to give a little bit of anecdotage here that might be of passing interest. The last time I saw the opera at the Metropolitan in New York, the two people uh, sitting in front of me evidently were not opera lovers. I suspect that someone couldn't come and gave the tickets to friends. Because throughout the evening, these two uh, wiggled around in their seats were struggling with the uh, English uh, synopsis, trying to find out what was happening, and when they finally came to the great scene of the union of the two at the end, where the prince and princess are brought into spiritual union by Sarastro, the gentleman turned to the lady beside him and in a hoarse whisper said, why didn't they get married in the first act and let us all go home? <laughs> This type of situation is typical in opera, as in the case of the forging of the sword Notong in Siegfried, in which I was uh, privileged to hear someone not far away remark, when will that blacksmith get finished? Uh, the, uh, high art, of course, has its devotees, but it is also quite uncomfortable. And when we are mentioning the discomforts of fine art, let us remember Papageno to whom the whole problem of the magic flute was just that uncomfortable, and who represents that type of mankind which is capable of going through the ceremony of initiation without noticing it, <laughs> without ever discovering that it happened, and who can reach the end of life saying that life is successful or unsuccessful only in terms of whether it has been comfortable or uncomfortable. And there are millions, therefore, who resemble him, even though the feathers are not visible. <laughs> uh, in the final scene, of course, we have the Hermetic Union. This is the marriage of the sun and moon, or the creation of the complete uh, homunculus or spiritual being within the consciousness of man. Here we have the polarized opposites uniting in eternal union to produce uh, the spiritualized and intuitive power of man's over-perception. 
the Greeks and Egyptians both agreed uh, that when the energies of man through discipline, through enlightenment, through method, through various procedures, more or less reminiscent of Eastern doctrines, but also in the West obtainable by pure consecration, by the gradual unfoldment and development of spiritual apperceptive powers, that when this union is finally consummated, man becomes truly human. Up to that time, he is only potentially human. He does not attain to his ultimate and complete humanity until, according to the ancients, he had received initiation. The ancient sacred number was twelve. And this number corresponded to the divisions of the circle or the great cycle of the labors of Hercules, which we call the zodiac. Man at birth is born after nine months of prenatal conditioning and preparation. For this reason, the Chinese celebrate his first birthday when he is three months old, because to them the prenatal epoch is part of the first year of life. But man, it is said, to achieve true birth must uh, pass through nine months in the womb of his mother and three degrees in the womb of the mysteries. For this reason, the ancient rites were nearly always divisible into three primary degrees. And these degrees represented man's ultimate mastery over the material, psychical, and spiritual mysteries of his own existence. He thus became master of body, soul, and mind, or body, mind, and spirit, according to the divisions uh, of a particular group. But the same implication is always involved. Man, by the mysteries, becomes human. He becomes human in the fact that there is then no deficiency left within him, and that his purposes, his ideals, his principles, his understanding are all truly human. And the Greeks, Egyptians, and Hindus have given us certain definitions of this human state. That man, as a human being, must abide in a world unique to himself. He can no longer accept the illusion of matter. He can no longer be controlled by the elements of the physical world. He is described as living in the world but not of it, because he has discovered that his true destiny and his true nature lies not in the achievement of material things but in the perfection and unfoldment of his own internal resources. Therefore, the true man is the man who lives to grow, to serve, to do, whereas the ignorant or mortal man is the one who lives to accumulate and exploit and variously pervert the universal energies around him in life. So the animal man abuses, the human being, the true human being, uses, and by right use sustains and justifies his own humanity. So that actually, the mysteries were not conceived as producing essentially super people. They were not really producing a higher order, actually, because this higher order was the true man. And we find this in the German mysteries and the German mystics, where we find the references to the man of earth and the man of heaven. <coughs> and we find in the writings of Bamey the reference to the two Adams. That Adam which is the parent of our mortality, and the second Adam, which is the parent of our immortality. And these are called the light and dark Adams, and they occur again in the rituals of the Kabbalah. For as Adam is the progenitor of mortal man, from Adamus the species, so the second Adam is the progenitor of the spiritual man. And the second Adam is the initiate adept. He is the symbol of the one who is to be the teacher and redeemer and progenitor of the spiritual life of man. These peoples, therefore, possessed what they believed and held to be certain secret arts and sciences, which were communicated by degrees only. And this progressive science of human regeneration constituted the substance of the mysteries. And it was this substance uh, that Adam Weishaupt wished to restore at the basis of the educational system of Europe. He had no way of realizing that the age of the mysteries was gone, 
And the young intellectuals at Ingolstadt who were seeking this same inspiration were not able to judge the weight of opposition or the terrible pressures of the political and social times in which they lived. The noble experiment did not succeed, but it left certain monuments and certain records beyond and behind it. And these monuments became of the gravest concern to tyrants, causing a century of effort to be made to wipe out every vestige, again, of this restoration of the mysteries in Europe. It was not possible or considered desirable to wipe out the magnificent music of Mozart or the wonderful opera which he built around this concept. It was very simple, therefore, simply to ignore or to deny its content. Let it remain as a magnificent piece of music. Let it remain as a fantasy, a wonderful tale drawn out of the Arabian nights of the human mind, but not to remember or to uh, recall that it was founded upon a great political experiment and that Mozart himself was working for this very end, that man, humanity, the young prince and princess, should be led together to liberty, led to a better way of life, led to an opening of universal opportunity, and that ultimately the reign of wisdom would be established in the world. This was attempted in the French Revolution, Revolution but failed. It was also attempted in the American Revolution, but the secret and priceless heritage of this experiment is still obscure, although we have constant evidence and consistent reminders that there was a purpose and a plan behind the formation of our Western way of life. Uh, we know that at one time George Washington was concerned over the Illuminist problem, and uh, there were a number of groups in this country who used it as a political football. And during some of the early uh, political campaigns involving John Adams and John Quincy Adams, it was rumored that the adversary was an Illuminist and therefore should not be under any condition elected to office. There was a scandal that lasted for about 15 or 20 years and brought some of the strongest wits of the time into play. Gradually, however, the entire matter faded from public attention and other purposes uh, became more uh, aggressively prominent. But the, uh, the Lodge of the Illuminists did linger and did have a part to play. And in uh, one of our publications on the Masonic Orders of Fraternity, we point out how this Illuministic movement and related Masonic interests were largely responsible for the revolution in Latin America under Simon Bolivar and the liberation of Italy under Giuseppe Garibaldi and the liberation of Mexico under Miguel Hidalgo. All of these men were connected with what were called the Reading Societies. And these Reading Societies were Illuminist groups that actually were established in Latin America. So this pattern goes on and on. But uh, perhaps there is no monument or document of it that has as much dramatic interest to us as the Magic Flute. Because in it, we are allowed to escape from the immediate political pressures of the 18th century and to sense perhaps the spiritual aspiration that was underneath all of this idea. And where and how could this spiritual aspiration be more adequately or beautifully set forth than in great music, which strikes directly into the inner life of the individual and reminds him of the great good that can be, that might be, if he man himself was able to accept it. So the mysterious world of Sarastro and his wonderful temples uh, disappears into a kind of thin air. But that thin air is within ourselves as an attenuated spiritual atmosphere. And all of these great contributions continue subconsciously to impel us toward the fulfillment of our great spiritual need and destiny. Thus, uh, he tells us in this opera that the mysteries as we knew them are gone but that society itself is now the place of initiation, that in the conspiracies of states and nations, in the tyranny of despots, and in the constant struggle for human life, man is passing through the subterranean passages of an initiation rite. And he now has a very wonderful and all-sufficient guide and leader in the form of Sarastro, increasing knowledge, universal education, the public school system, and all these things. Imperfect, certainly, but imperfect only because man is willing to permit them to be that way. 
because Sarastro can be merely a demagogue as he represents education. But if man will meet him, will retire into the rights and mysteries which he requires, wisdom will bestow its greater blessings. Man does not need to live upon the surface of knowledge any longer than he desires to. For the moment he has the necessary insight, he can penetrate that surface and come into the presence of greater and more noble realities and truths. All of this is set forth to remind man that beneath the surface of his living is a secret meaning, and that if he will seek this meaning and will demand of others around him, his leaders, uh, those who represent him in various public relationships, if he will demand from these the high standard represented in the story of the magic flute, he can have it. But man must decide whether he is going to be the man or the mouse in this case. Uh, perhaps more correctly, whether he will be the prince or Papageno. Whether he will be willing merely to hunt for a mate and be satisfied completely with a physical existence or, and satisfied also to shake away evil with his sistrum or his little stick of bells or whether he will actually seek solution. If he is willing to seek solution, he can find it. If he is willing to follow the ancient road shown by Sarastro in the temple and is willing to be led into the mysteries, he will then find beyond the better world, the greater civilization, and he can build the restoration of the shrines of Isis and Osiris. These simply represent the shrines of truth everywhere available. Truth now hidden deeply so-called underground, locked within the psychic life of man. So the final drama is the unfolding of the soul within man and its final emergence under the directing power of reason, so that finally within the heart and mind are the magnificent pageantries of this opera. All these different points and different systems and symbols have interest for us and each must choose in his own way that which he considers most appropriate to his own need. But one thing I think we can say beyond any question of doubt, this is not a comic opera, nor was it intended primarily to amuse. It was intended to strike the conscience of the people of Austria and later the people of the world. We can paraphrase the famous lines of Hamlet in this case and say the opera is the thing with which to catch the conscience of the king. In this case the king was a queen, Maria Theresa, but the purpose of the opera was to catch the conscience of Austria and to cause this nation to become a leader in the spiritual life of Europe. It was satisfied, however, to play the part of Papageno and gave us some delightful waltzes by Strauss. It did not give us, however, the liberation, because Austria did not attain it. But it was Mozart's dream and hope that this country would lead the great restoration of learning. Actually, it did, but only in him. He became an imperishable monument to the dream which could have been Austria but which was finally destroyed in the fall and collapse of the Habsburgs. But in Mozart, Austria lives. In Mozart also, the Illuminati found a name and a patron who has conferred upon them eternal honor. I think that is the subject for this evening.